You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. All by myself. Don't wanna be all by myself. But I am. What's up, everybody? How's it going? My name is Jimmy Wong. You are listening slash watching the Command Zone podcast here on the Command Zone YouTube channel or maybe on a podcast channel. Uh, regardless, there's only one voice in the room today, and it's mine. All by myself, there's been some sickness. There's been some out-of-town issues. So I'm coming in to do something that no one has ever done before, survive the nuclear fallout by himself to do an in the 99 about the cards that you need to know from Fallout. So Universes Beyond Fallout is now upon us, just like the protagonist in the in the games. I wake up lonely and by myself inside a vault, in this case, the podcast room. So we've covered all of the pre-cons for the set and the upgrades, but we're going to zoom in a little bit using our uh, VAT system on the cards that are going to fit into the 99 of those decks, as well as some of the commanders that are notable from the set. So we're going to cover the legendary creatures and the cards that you need to know from Fallout. But before we get into it, let's talk about our sponsors. First up, we got cardkingdom.com slash command. That's the place you're going to go if you're going to buy any of these cards. In fact, there's a ton of new cards coming out beyond just this universe is beyond. We got a great taste of it at MagicCon Chicago, but we've got some amazing cards from, oh, I don't know, Assassin's Creed and Bloomboro. There's a lot of great stuff on the horizon. If you want to pick up any of it, go to cardkingdom.com slash command. You can get your cards there as well as sealed products, singles, and more. And they'll ship directly to your house in one convenient package. It's the place to go if you also want to support this show, Card kingdom.com slash command our other sponsor for the show is ultra pro you can go to ultrapro.com slash command to visit our affiliate link there ultra pro is the game accessories brand that josh myself and others in this office have trust our own collections to all of my cards are in their amazing binders they also have wall scrolls play mats deck boxes sleeves you name it ultra pro has it for nearly every single collectible hobby so if you go to ultrapro.com slash command you can see some of the incredible deals they have there as well as just shop for the products that you need to outfit your battlefield to look super duper cool especially Especially with Fallout on the way, they're going to have some exclusive Fallout-themed stuff that only they have the license to. And that's the best part about Ultra Pros. They got all of that amazing magic art printed at high quality on their playmats. They've been doing this for decades, so you know the quality is top tier. You're going to get a great product, also sometimes at a great deal. So go to ultrapro.com slash command if you want to support the show that way. Finally, the last way to support the show is directly at patreon.com slash command zone. There, you can join our Discord at the lowest tier. At higher tiers, you'll get also get access to exclusive content. Every single patron, however, gets access to stuff like extra turns and game nights a day early. So if you want to check out any of that stuff before the general public and support our show directly, help keep the lights on around here, maybe find me a new co-host because everyone is gone today, patreon.com slash command zone. We also shout out one lucky patron every single episode. So this episode is dedicated to Caleb Hayes. Caleb. You rock. All right, let's get into it. Cards that you need to know from Fallout. We got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to get right into it. We were speaking for about a couple of hours here, so I got to drink some waters. So if you ever see me take a break for that, that's why. All right, here we go. First up, we have the Battle of Hoover Dam. So this is three in the white for an enchantment. As Battle of Hoover Dam enters the battlefield, choose NCR or Legion, which are the two forces fighting each other in the game. NCR says, at the beginning of your end step, return target creature card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield with a finality counter on it. And Legion says, whenever a creature you control dies, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature you control. All right, so finality counters are a special type of counter that were introduced recently. If a creature has a finality counter and it would die, instead, exile it. So this is like, oh, you've reanimated something, but it can only come back one time, so you can't repeat those shenanigans. Uh, this also, this card is also very similar to the Cons and Dragons Siege enchantments. If you guys remember Citadel Siege, Outpost Siege, and all of those back from those days. Uh, so it's very similar to those where you also choose a mode as it comes in, and they all usually sit around four mana as well. However, this is a battle, but I guess a battle technically counts as a siege, right, Jimmy? 
<laughs> wow, what a great joke, Jimmy. I agree. A battle can be a siege, but is a siege a battle? It's like it's a, a square is a rectangle, but the rectangle isn't a square, right, Jimmy? <laughs> oh, Jimmy, you're so smart. All right, so let's talk about the top section first, which is NCR. This is by far the more powerful of the two. It's one time per turn at the beginning of your end step, but returning a creature card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield is pretty powerful because it reminds us of other really powerful cards, the cards like Abiding Grace. This is an enchantment that you get to choose one each time. One of them is gain one life, but the other is returning a creature card with mana value one from your graveyard to the battlefield. So a lot more narrow. However, that doesn't come with a finality counter. This is also really similar to Celestine the Living Saint, but less uh, sort of finicky in terms of how you can activate it. Celestine, you're returning creature cards with mana value X or less, where X is the amount of life you've gained this turn, and again, at the beginning of your end step. And of course, if you're a fan of Sun Titan, this is similar in a way. Sun Titan can grab permanence. This is creatures only with the Battle of Hoover Dam. But I believe that in general, if you're looking to reanimate stuff, especially in mono white decks that are looking to eke out a little bit of extra value that other colors provide, uh, this is going to be a pretty solid card. It's also really good with creatures that sacrifice themselves, especially that, that have three mana value or less. Because it means that you can sacrifice it, go to your end step, bring it back, and then use that sacrifice or enter the battlefield ability again. So the top one that comes to mind for this is the Ranger Captain of Eos. This is a very powerful card. You see it in high-end CEDH tables. You also see it, I believe, in some legacy formats. But it is 1-1 one, one white for a 3-3. Three, three. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a creature card with CMC 1 or less, mana value 1 or less. Reveal it and put it into your hand and shuffle your library. So that's a great ETB to get two of. You can grab an Esper Sentinel with this. You can grab a lot of different stuff, um, Mother of Runes. Uh, you can also sacrifice Ranger Captain of Vios, and your opponents can't cast non-creature spells this turn. So whether you're doing it on your turn to pop off or you're waiting for your opponent's turn to go there, untap, and then you do it then during their upkeep, it's really powerful because it basically shuts down the rest of their non-creature spells for that turn. So for someone that's looking to storm off or win the game, Ranger Captain is really good at that. And the fact that you now get two looks at it with Battle of Hoover Dam makes this even better. So this means for one white white in Battle of Hoover Dam, you get a to search for two creatures and stop basically two turns from happening or protect your own turn uh, from any counter spells and stuff like that. Other creatures that you can sacrifice would be like Selfless Spirit. This is a flying spirit cleric that you can sack it to give your creatures indestructible until end of turn. So you can use a dodge a board wipe or even just one for one removal. Sometimes it feels really bad. Someone goes to destroy one thing that you have and you, of course you sacrifice a Selfless Spirit normally to protect your whole board, but in this case just to protect one thing. But with Battle of Hoover Dam and other ways to reanimate stuff in white, there's plenty. Now you get multiple uses of it, so you feel less bad about using it for just sort of that one-off scenario sometimes. Cathar Commando is a creature that you can pay one to sack and destroy an artifact or enchantment. And Selfless Savior is similar to Selfless Spirit, but it is only for one creature getting indestructible. Similar to Benevolent Bodyguard. There's a bunch of creatures that do this in white. Um, but we don't want to talk about this card just for Mono White. This card goes well in other decks as well, other decks with more colors. Notably, I will mention a card like Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. This card is just disgusting with Battle of Hoover Dam. So Uro will enter the battlefield, gain you three life, draw you a card, and you can put a land on the battlefield from your hand, but it will automatically sacrifice itself unless it escaped. So it goes to your graveyard, and then you can pay an escape cost to recast it later. But this is a three drop, and you can just rebuy it with the Battle of Hoover Dam. Uh, it will get that finality counter, so it won't go back to the graveyard the next time. But this is, again, when you're getting multiple activations of creatures and you're not basing your whole strategy around just an Uro, then you're okay if it potentially does go ahead and get finality countered. Another really mean way to go about this is playing cards like Fleshbag Marauder or Playcrafter. So these are edict effects that enter the battlefield. Each player must sacrifice a creature. So normally you sacrifice the Fleshbag or the Playcrafter to itself, or if you have some more dinky creature around, you can sack that too. But in the case of Battle of Hoover Dam, you play the Fleshbag, it sacks itself, everyone sacks something, end of turn, you bring the Fleshbag back, everyone sacks another creature. Double Edicts in a single turn can sometimes just be game over for certain types of decks. Um, this is definitely on the meaner side, but I usually, you know, I don't mind seeing a Fleshbag on the table. Um, it means that things are going to happen, and if your deck is getting super affected by it, it might be something that you might want to consider to, uh, you know, build around a little bit next time. So... The finality counter we mentioned is sort of a downside in certain scenarios. Maybe you want to keep bringing your Uro back over and over again. So there are ways to flicker in white as well as other colors. Um, but we're just talking about white here. You have Ephemerate, Cloud Shift, are both instant speed. And the best part about this is that you can really, really go nuts with this. So imagine you have your flesh bag. It enters the battlefield. It dies. You go to end the turn. 
the battle brings it back, another edict effect. And then in response to the edict effect, you can ephemerate the flesh bag to bounce it, return it, so it no longer has the finality counter. You will have, have to have something else sacrificed because that trigger will still be on the stack. But that's three edicts in a single turn, or three Uros in a single turn, or three Ranger Captains in a single turn. You can sort of see what we're going at here. And so having that finality counter taken off means that you can use it once again the next time that your battle triggers. Flicker Wisp is also super good in this scenario because it is itself a three mana creature that when it enters, it will exile another target permanent. So you can use this to flicker the Ranger Captain you just got back to get another one CMC spell out of your deck, right? So there's a lot of different ways to do some pretty nasty things here with Battle of Hoover Dam. And finally, if you watched the Game Nights episode where I played Bernard, we'll talk about that more in a second, a card called Power Conduit is really great in these decks. You can tap it to remove a counter from a permanent you control, and you can either put a charge counter on an artifact or a 1-1 counter on target creature. So when the creature comes back, now you have a finality counter that is a regular counter that Power Conduit can remove. It's a really fun little thing. You can also buffer creatures up and seems just like the kind of value that you're looking for. So other commanders that this card might go well with, we've got Carmen, Cruel Sky Marcher. This is a three white black two two flyer. Whenever a player sacks a permanent, put a one one counter on Carmen, and then whenever Carmen attacks, return up to one target permanent card with mana value less than or equal to Carmen's power from your graveyard to the battlefield. So you can play the flesh bag, sack it, Carmen becomes a three three, and then you basically have the same effect as Battle of Hoover Dam. Um, I think if you're playing Battle of Hoover Dam in this deck, you don't want to build too high on the CMC scale of going four or above, even if you're playing with Carmen. Um, I think just having a reliable three to always bring back is good, and it also means that your mana curve is not going to be too high because your commander is a five drop. Luris of the Dream Den is another potential. Uh, this is a companion card that itself just says during each of your turns, you may cast one permanent spell with a CMC two or less from your graveyard, or mana value, sorry. And the companion for this is each permanent in your starting deck has mana value two or less. So this would be Luris as commander. Battle of Hoover Dam would be just another way to get stuff back. And then finally, Bernard Ginger Sculptor is probably where I would slot this in almost immediately. This says whenever a non-token your creature control dies, you may exile it. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except it's a 1-1 one, one food golem artifact, and you would use this with, like, for instance, your selfless series and benevolent bodyguards. But in this sort of deck, Bernard, I think, is a target for removal. So having a Battle of Hoover Dam is really important because you, it says you may exile it with Bernard. So if you had Bernard out and you managed to get battle down and you have a Ranger Captain, you could sacrifice it, bring it back with that finality counter, find a way to flicker it or whatever, power conduit, and then you could Bernard it for the second time. So you're just getting extra duper, super duper value out of all of it. The Legion side is a lot more simple. I think this deck, this card can only really go in decks that have sacrifice outlets either on their commander or is just all about sacking stuff. So like Alenda the Dusk Rose wants creatures to die and you also want to sacrifice Alenda itself to make a bunch of 1-1 white vampire creature tokens. You got like Nadir, Agent of the Dusk Canal, which has partners, so you'd have to find a commander with white and partner to partner with this. But it says whenever a token you control leaves the battlefield, you put a 1-1 counter, and then whenever Nadir leaves the battlefield, it's similar to Alenda, you make a bunch of 1-1 green elf warrior tokens equal to its power. So that's a deck that wants to sack a bunch of stuff, has a bunch of tokens to sack, uh, and then obviously we're going to have some value pieces to bring back. Sabaz, the Glimmer Wasp, is a modular deck that is, again, all about sacrificing things modular creatures specifically so being able to bring those back is powerful and then you got like rayhan last of the obzon which also has partners so you'd have to find a white partner with that and this basically lets you move one one counters around when creatures get sacrificed so i think it's like pretty simple when it comes to looking at the legion side i would like to know from the audience what do you enjoy more in your deck building? Are you looking to put two, pl a bunch of 1-1 counters on stuff, make a really big commander, or have it care about 1-1 counters? Or are you more about the Sun Titan, um, Celestine Living Saint sort of reanimation value part of battle? I don't really think there's a deck that's going to want to play both sides. Um, so I think if you, this is in your deck, you're sort of going with one over the other. That's page one done of, oh goodness, so many others. Let's keep going. Let's talk about the bobbleheads next. So this is a really interesting series of cards that are across all of the Fallout pre-cons. They are the bobbleheads, which are sort of collectibles that you find in-game. But they all have different uh, flavorful names to them that also affect sort of like the stats that you boost in-game. So by themselves, they're not really making much of a splash, but they care about how many other quote-unquote bobbleheads are on the battlefield. So let's go through them really quick here. I'm going to read them out. Um, they all are a three-mana artifact that has the first ability to tap to add for one mana of any color. 
So that by itself is just a three mana rock, any color fixing. The first one is the Strength Bobblehead. This is an activated ability that is three in tap. Put X 1 1 counters on target creature where X is the number of bobbleheads you control. Activate only as a sorcery. We'll find that only a few of these have activate only as a sorcery on them. You have the Perception Bobblehead, which has the activated ability three in tap. Look at the top X cards of your library where X is the number of bobbleheads you control. You may cast a spell with mana value three or less from among them without paying its mana cost, but the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this is a great way to cast other bobbleheads off the bobbleheads you already have. The Endurance Bobblehead is three tap up to X target creatures you control get plus one plus O and gain indestructible until end of turn, where X is the number of bobbleheads you control as you activate this ability, activate only as a sorcery. So it looked pretty cool at first, you might be able to give a creature indestructible in response to a board wipe, but this is only at sorcery speed, so serve sort of has to be on your turn. The Charisma Bobblehead has four tap, create X11 white soldier tokens, where X is the number of bobbleheads you control, again, only as a sorcery. Intelligence Bobblehead has five tap, draw X cards, where X is the number of bobbleheads you control. That one's pretty pricey. And then Agility Bobblehead is three tap, up to X target creatures you control, each gain haste until end of turn, and can't be blocked to this turn, except by creatures with haste, where X is the number of bobbleheads you control as you activate this ability. This one doesn't need to say activate only a sorcery speed, but it kind of only works on your turn. And then finally, we have the Luck Bobblehead, which is one tap, roll X six-sided dice where X is the number of bobbleheads you control. Create a tapped treasure token for each even result. And if you rolled six exactly seven times, you win the game. So that is uh, by itself one Oh, one divided by six times seven, extremely low odds. I think that's what it is at least. Or it's one six times one six times one six. Yeah, basically that. Um, so yeah, those are the five, or sorry, six, seven different bobbleheads. Um, together they are very strong. So they get exponential, well not exponential, they get incrementally more powerful the more that you have. And obviously some of them are better than the others. So if you're gonna wanna search these out, there's a bunch of ways to do so in mono blue as well as white and other colors, of course, have natural tutors. Fabricate finds artifacts. Trophy Mage finds artifacts with Man Value 3 specifically. Moon Silver Key does the same thing. And Oswald Fiddlebender is a way to sort of sacrifice something and then find something bigger from that. So there are a lot of different ways to tutor these out. But I think the thing that you're actually looking for is to care about how many bobbleheads you control when it comes to artifact synergy. So it doesn't matter if you have all the different ones out. In fact, you may not even want to play some of these in your deck if you don't need the effect. But if you can actually duplicate the bobbleheads and make another one, these are artifact dash bobblehead. And so it doesn't care about differently named bobbleheads, just how many bobbleheads you control. So a commander like Ozgear the Reconstructor is pretty good here. It allows you to sack artifacts to give creatures plus two plus oh, and then from your graveyard, you can pay X and exile it, uh, where X is equal to the mana value of the artifact, and you're going to create two tokens that are copies of the exiled card. So in that way, you can double up the number of bobbleheads and get that bobblehead count going. Wow, how many times have I said bobblehead at this time? Bobbleheads, 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 bobblehead, bobbleheads, bobblehead, bobbleheads, 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 Other ways to do so are Mechanized Production. This is an enchantment aura that at the beginning of your upkeep, you create a token that's a copy of enchanted artifact. Then if you control eight or more artifacts with the same name as one another, you win the game. So that is like a very slow win con. There are some decks out there that are built to just get Mechanized Production wins. But this seems pretty good in the bobblehead deck. And then, of course, if you're going to use all these bobbleheads, you noted that all the activated abilities are three mana, four mana, or five, except for the luck bobblehead. So you're going to want to find ways to reduce the mana cost of this. A new card that just came out in MKM is Forensic Gadgeteer. Uh, it allows you to investigate whenever you cast an artifact spell, which is great already. But then it also says activate abilities of artifacts you control cost one less to activate. And it can't reduce the mana in that cost to less than one mana. So now your clues cost one. But more importantly, all your bobbleheads are also going to cost one less. And then you've also got the Zirda, the Dawn Waker deck. This just says abilities you activate that aren't mana abilities cost two less to activate. This effect can't reduce the mana in that cost to less than one mana. So this is super good because you have a bunch of three cost bobbleheads. It's going to reduce, reduce them all to one. Notably, Training Grounds is creature only. So Zerda is an effect that you'd rather want in this deck. 
And it also has the companion of each permanent card in your starting deck has an activated ability. So you might be able to build a deck with Zerda that just has full activated abilities and have this as the companion. Uh, Zerda notably also goes infinite with Basalt Monolith. And I think something that's really important in this deck is you need to have as much mana as possible, both to cast the bobbleheads, to activate them, to also untap them, which we'll talk about in a second here. But having as much mana as possible means that you can activate them a bunch and really have the important powerful effects. For instance, you're going to want to use the Charisma bobblehead to make a bunch of white soldier tokens, and then the Agility bobblehead to give them all haste, followed by the Strength bobblehead or the Endurance bobblehead to basically make sure that you're cracking for a ton of damage. So that's sort of like the win con if you're going for the bobblehead dot deck. Of course, if you can untap the bobbleheads, that means you can activate them more than once, which is pretty powerful when it cuts to the stuff like the endurance bobblehead or strength or even luck, I guess, if you really want to go for that win. So unwinding clock seems like an amazing card in this deck. Untap all artifacts you control during each player's untap step. So this allows you to untap them a bunch. Again, if you have ways to make a ton of mana, then this is obviously very powerful. And notably, I think three of them say activate only as a sorcery, and one of them doesn't really matter. So for what it's worth, it's good, but it's not amazing. I think you're actually probably better off using single untap abilities. So cards like Kelpley Guide, Fate Stitcher, Iorinth of the Healing House, Kiora, Behemoth Beckoner, or a Fedo Alchemist, or even Nimble Claw Adept, which allows you to tap two target permanents, but of course only as a sorcery. Uh, seems pretty powerful because you're going to want to use the abilities on your turn for the most part. This deck kind of shows the players where you're going and what you're going to do because your bobbleheads say activate only as a sorcery and it's pretty clear when you make a bunch of tokens and give them plus one plus oh, you're going to be swinging at someone. Okay, so that's sort of the bottle, bobble, bobble, bobble. Finding a commander for the bobblehead deck isn't so easy. I think... Ultimately, you're going to want Jeskai colors, but the energy commanders don't really do the trick that are in the deck that we'll talk about later, like Madison Lee. So maybe you can try something like a Jeskai commander that can play um, a Dynahair, Invoker Adept. This is interesting. This is one in Jeskai for a haste creature. You, can, you may activate abilities of other creatures you control as though those creatures had haste. And tap when you next activate an ability this turn by spending four or more mana to activate it. Copy that ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. So there are one, two abilities, which are the Charisma Bobblehead and the Intelligence Bobblehead. Intelligence is drawing cards, and Charisma is creating one ones that are affected by that. But Dynair is great because you can build a whole deck with Zerda as the companion because you just want to have a bunch of activated abilities on all of your permanents. Um, you also have stuff like Commander Liara Portier, which is interesting. It allows you to exile... Uh, whenever you attack spells you cast from exile, this turn costs X less to cast, where X is the number of players being attacked, so you're going to want to go wide. And then it says exile the top X cards of your library until end of turn you may cast spells from among those exiled cards. So if you attack three opponents with three tokens or one ones, you get to look at the top three cards of your deck, and then bam, you can cast anything, three or less, which would be all the bobbleheads. Brew the Cloud Telcor Engineer is interesting because it allows you to create a 2-1 blue mirror artifact creature token at the beginning of combat, but then you may choose a token you control, including the one you just made, and then each other token you control becomes a copy of that token. So this is a great way to potentially use the Brutaclad to make copies of tokens, and then those tokens, you know, there's just stuff you can do there. Um, I'm not a huge Brutaclad fan. It takes my brain too much power to actually know what's going on. Uh, you also have Thanos, Solemn Survivor. This is not Jeskai, this is Esper. But it allows you to create tokens that are a copy of one target artifact token you control. And you can play, pay one in Esper to sack two artifact tokens to exile an artifact or creature card from your graveyard. And then you make a token that's a copy of the exiled card. So you just have to find ways to make tokens in the beginning. And then you can sort of get it going by just making more copies of your bobbleheads. And then you can maybe do the uh, Stranger Things reskins. There's Bjorna and Hargilda. Hargilda allows you to tap two mana to spend this mana to cast artifact spells or activate abilities of artifacts. And then Bjorn allows you to sack artifacts, deal cre damage to creatures, and goad them. So a lot of ways to do this. Uh, honestly, the bobbleheads, I think, are just a fun experiment. It definitely is a lower power deck for sure. Um, and you're probably going to want to find win cons that are not the luck bobblehead. As well as not just straight up the charisma bobblehead either, just to make a bunch of 1-1s, one because a mass artifact removal spell is really going to get in your way. So it, if anything, it's kind of more of a just a fun deck for what it's worth. Um, so I would say not really possible to build this one super competitively unless you're going again for infinite mana and infinite uh, abilities to untap everything. So you can just go that way. 
but that might not be up your alley as well. All right, moving on, let's talk about Kate Cage Brawler. This is in the Scrappy Survivors deck. Kate is a red-green legendary creature human warrior. That's a 1-1. As long as it's your turn, Kate has Indestructible. Whenever Kate attacks, you and defending player each draw a card, then discard a card. Put two 1-1 counters on Kate if you discard the card with the highest mana value among those cards or tied for highest. So Kate comes in, punches at a 1-1. You and an opponent both get to draw and discard. Doesn't need to be the opponent, by the way, that... Oh, no, no, sorry. It is the opponent that you are attacking. Uh, and then if you discard the card with higher mana value, you put two 1-1 counters on Kate, who is indestructible. So she can definitely get big fast, and she's also two-drop commander, so she will be on the battlefield pretty quickly. So you're going to want to discard real spells so you can get those counters on her. But what are ways to get around this downside? The first would be Madness. So a card like Alchemist Greeting, you would discard, and it's a five mana value spell, but you can Madness it for one in a red, and they can deal four damage to her creature, maybe the creature that they're going to use to block. Um, you also have the brand new Emrakul, The World Anew. Uh, this is a new card that is not out quite yet. It's going to be out um, later this year. Uh, and this is a 12 mana, 12, 12, but it does have madness on it where you can pay six colorless mana. So you'd really have to build your mana uh, in your deck to be able to do that, but this is a option. <laughs> You've also got Violent Eruption, which is one red, 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 that can madness for one red, red, and it deals four damage divided as you choose among any number of targets. So I really like the removal spells here because, again, Kate is a, a card that wants to just hit you a bunch of times. So having Madness is a way to get around that, as well as having a higher mana value than what your opponent might discard. You also have cards that are just good in the graveyard. So Scavenged Brawler is a 6-mana Vigilance Flying Trample Lifelink that you can pay 5 to exile from your graveyard, and you can choose a creature to put basically the Scavenged Brawler on top. So 4 woman counters, Flying Counter, Vigilance Counter, Trample Counter, and a Lifelink Counter activate only as a Sorcery. So I would imagine if you threw this on Kate... You now have a Flying Vigilance Trample Lifelink Indestructible on your turn. Minimum size 5-5 five, five, up to 7-7. Seven, seven. That thing is going to start murdering people. So that's pretty good. Um, you can also throw an Anger into the graveyard or a Squee Goblin to Bob, Squee the Immortal. These cards are basically going to allow you to cast them from the graveyard. So if you're going to be discarding a bunch, you want to have extra value from the draw discard. So Currency Converter is a great way to do so. Whenever you discard a card, you may exile that card from your graveyard. And then you can basically tap to put a card exiled with it into your graveyard. If it's a land, you make a treasure. If it's a non-land, you create a 2-2 black rogue. So this just basically takes something you discard into it. And then it once per turn or once per tap, you tap it, throw that into the graveyard for real. And then allow that to basically become something else. Inti, Seneschal of the Sun, is a new commander from uh, Ixalan recently. This says, whenever you discard one or more cards, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card until your next end step. So that's just great value for red-green with this commander. Um, you also have Jorael, Moan, Voli, Recluse. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, you make a 2-2 green cat creature token. This is counting as a second card draw every single turn where you do attack with Kate. And then you have like Alhamar's Archive, which allows you to draw twice as much. So... That's sort of the draw discard part of it. Let's talk about the fact that your commander is just straight up indestructible. Cheap, aggressive, indestructible. You might want to go aggro with this deck. So you've got cards like the Reaver Cleaver, which gives very importantly trample. Two in a red for a three equip cost. Artifact equipment. Equip creature gets plus one, plus one that has trample. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player or a planeswalker, create that many treasure tokens. So very good to make a bunch of treasure tokens. Keep the pain train rolling. You got your Xenagoses and type in this deck. You also have like Sword of Light and Shadow, which is the black and white sword. Uh, and it says whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, you gain three life, and you can return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So it's a slower regrow, but it allows you to do so. Uh, you're in red-green, though, so you're already probably going to be playing your Noxious Revivals and Balagate Recoveries and all that. Uh, this is a new fun one. Gimli's Reckless Might. Creatures you control have haste, three in a red. Formidable. Whenever you attack, if creatures you control have total power eight or greater, target attacking creature you control fights up to one target creature you don't control. Really good when your commander is indestructible because it's not going to die from that fight. Outside of that, you can also be casting board wipes in this deck. So let's say that Kate is one of your only creatures. Then a Fiery Confluence or Chandra's Ignition are all ways to basically wipe the board once your creature gets big enough or you just want to do some damage. And then from there, you can have free swings, free value, and sort of can keep that pain coming. 
And then there's stuff like Arc Bond as well. Uh, choose target creature whenever that creature is dealt damage this turn. It deals damage damage to each other creature and each player, including itself when it gets hit originally. And then it, like an arc of lightning shoots out and hits everything else on the board. So great way to get someone if they decide to block and then wipe out a lot of other stuff on the board because it's each creature on the board, not just the opponent. All right, let's move on to Dr. Madison Lee. So one of the main characters in the game, very important character, and the return of energy, notably. Those of you that have been around since Kaladesh are probably rootin' and hootin' and tollerin'. Tollerin'? I don't know. Uh, those of you that played Standard during this time, probably not hootin' and rootin' so much. Dr. Madison Lee is red, white, and blue. Jess guy for a 2-3 human scientist. Whenever you cast an artifact spell, you get one energy, or an energy counter. These are tracked outside of the game. You can pay or tap and pay one energy and give a creature plus one plus oh and gain trample and haste until end of turn so it can also be your opponent's creatures notably if you tap and pay three energy you draw a card and if you tap and pay five energy you return target artifact card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped so a lot of sweet abilities here drawing cards giving creatures trample haste and more importantly returning artifacts from the graveyard to the battlefield now, the pre-con itself has a lot of different ways to generate energy. So before you build Madison Lee, I highly recommend looking through the pre-con, even just buying the pre-con, because a lot of cards in there do care about energy and are going to be new additions to the energy world. Uh, back during Kaladesh, I would say they didn't really design as much. There wasn't like a commander deck for Kaladesh that was all about energy. If Kaladesh came out again today, there definitely would be. But until then, you have the Fallout pre-con instead. Uh, but the cards that do produce energy from the past are cards like Electrostatic Pummeler, which is a three-mana construct that gives you three energy when it enters the battlefield. And of course, you can pay three energy to sort of pump it up real, real big. Decoction Module, two-mana artifact. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under control, you get an energy. So that's really powerful. And then a brand new card coming out again, uh, same time that the new Emrakul is, is Scurry of Gremlins. Two, a red and a white for an enchantment. One scurry of gremlins enters the battlefield. Create two, one, one red gremlin creature tokens. Then you get an amount of energy equal to the number of creatures you control. And then you can use this to pay energy to give basically the exact same effect as Madison Lee, but four energy instead. So a lot of different ways to gain energy. I would just look through again the list. You can go on Scryfall as well and just look up energy counter and any card that has that will show up. You can also restrict it to the Jeskai colors. When you generate energy, there are ways to generate more energy because these are counters. So Lazel, Vlacketh's champion, says if one or more, if you would put one or more counters on a creature or planeswalker you control, uh, or on yourself, notably, that's the keyword there, put that many plus one of each of those kinds of counters on that permanent or player instead. So very, very good with your decoction module as well as Dr. Madison Lee. Flux Chandler just says when you cast a non-creature spell, proliferate. You're looking to cast a bunch of artifacts. So that's going to be really good as well. So those are both ways to make your energy production even higher. Okay, now let's talk about the fact that Mass and Lee's best ability is the ability to return artifacts from the graveyard to the battlefield. So you're going to want to find ways to both draw a bunch of cards and get cards into your graveyard. So you're going to need a really strong draw engine. Joyra, Weatherlight Captain is a great one. This, whenever you cast a historic spell, draw a card. Artifacts are included in historic spells. Riddlesmith, whenever you cast an artifact, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. And then you also have other looters like Smuggler's Copter or Doretti Scrap Savant. Because what you're going to want to do in this deck is reanimate really huge, fat, and scary artifacts. Gonti's Ether Heart is the big one. This allows you to pay a bunch of energy. I think it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 to exile to take an extra turn. But this also just says whenever it or another artifact enters the battlefield under your control, you get two energy counters. Pretty good. Portal to Phyrexia seems like a pretty good artifact to reanimate from the graveyard, as well as a card like Angel of the Ruins. So a lot of different ways to help loop those Enter the Battlefield effects, um, have more artifacts enter the battlefield, and just get a bunch of stuff going on. Notably, Dr. Madison Lee wants you to cast artifacts, so reanimating them with her last ability won't get you an energy, but it's still a pretty powerful effect to get, you know, Portal to Phyrexia back. That will take over a game pretty quickly. You also have cards that are going to be able to get you your artifacts back without having to use Dr. Madison Lee's ability. I highly recommend having these in the deck anyway. Goblin Welder allows you to switch artifacts out, both on your battlefield and other battlefields. 
goblin engineer allows you to tutor something into your graveyard. So it could be a huge uh, artifact, any artifact. And you can also use a goblin engineer for a similar effect for a red tap at sack an artifact and you return an artifact with man value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So again, another way to loop stuff. Iron Soul Enforcer. This is four and a white, four, four artifact creature, notably. Whenever Iron Soul Enforcer or a commander you control attacks alone, return the artifact card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So again, very powerful with all the other abilities going on. Typically, it's going to be the Iron Soul Enforcer playing, but you could play Iron Soul Enforcer and then just swing with Madison Lee that turn, bring back a portal to Frexia or whatever it is. So pretty powerful stuff there. So... I like Dr. Madison Lee quite a bit. It's a fun return to energy. Just because you have to deal with energy as a whole means that it's not going to be as powerful because you have to sort of manage this whole other thing. You're playing not as optimal cards in the deck to just get to use the energy uh, synergies. But it's a lot of fun. And if you haven't built an energy deck before, this could be your calling to do one now. I'll also look inside the pre-con. There are backup commanders that are also viable for this. All right. Next up, we have Inventory Management. This has had a lot of people talking about it online. This is a red and a white for an instant with split second. And it's, that means that as long as this spell is on the stack, players can't cast spells or activate abilities that aren't mana abilities. This is sort of similar to Ranger Captain of Eos in a way in that when you play this, everything just freezes. No one can respond. There's no counter spells that can happen. It basically ends the stack where it is and guarantees it that it'll basically happen. We used to play Cross and Grip on a lot back in the day because of the same thing. So inventory management's real ability says, for each aura and equipment you control, you may attach it to a creature you control. So great thematic here, uh, theme here with the inventory management uh, thing that we do in most games like Fallout. But this is a very powerful effect, but a bit narrow because it cares just about auras and equipment. So we've seen this before with cards like Magnetic Theft, which is an instant that allows you to attach just one target equipment to target creature. Um, and that's good, but it's not amazing compared to what inventory management does. Now, inventory management specifically cannot choose just a few of your auras and enchantments or equipment. Every single thing is going to be going on to another creature. But it's really powerful because it basically allows you to be a protection spell as well. Cards like Sejiri Shelter give your cards protection from a certain color and usually allow that card to then smack in or stop a removal spell. So imagine you're swinging and a creature has a Sword of Feast of Famine attached to it, but you have another creature that's going to be unblocked. Your opponent goes to block the Sword of Feast of Famine creature, and then you can at instant speed cast Inventory Management and switch the Feast of Famine off to something else and then have that hit, deal the combat damage, do all those triggers, and then you're off to the races. Um, you could also move a Lightning Greaves as instant speed protection. There's a lot of things that you can do here. They blocked to maybe avoid losing a creature. They thought they were chumping. Now you can get rid of it. It is still sort of like a removal spell, ultimately, like a one-shot removal spell with occasional upside of like, hey, I get a damage trigger that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise, uh, but you might lose the other creature that you're attacking with. So it's a really interesting card for that reason. I think when it comes to commanders that work with it, you're going to want to find decks that really only are equipment or strategies in this deck. Um, and you're going to want to be you know, very specific too about whether or not your deck is all equipment uh, or all auras. Um, because again, this does move each equipment and aura, but you may have decks that you want to go wide. So for instance, like Wyleth Soul of Steel is great, but it doesn't want to go wide. Uh, so, so inventory management would go really well on this deck because you could bring it all onto your commander and attack. And then let's say Wyleth has done its thing. You've drawn seven cards off it and now you need to put it on the flyer. Well, you haven't wasted all your R's by sticking them on just Wyleth. You can use inventory management to move it off. Okay, moving on, we have Kellogg, not the cereal, Dangerous Mind. So Kellogg is a human mercenary, one red and a black, right up my alley, by the way. I love this kind of card. It's a 3-2 with first strike and haste. Whenever Kellogg attacks, create a treasure token. And then you can sacrifice five treasures, gain control of target creature for as long as you control Kellogg, activate only as a sorcery. So this is from the Hail Caesar deck or Kazar deck. Uh, it's really similar to like Jolene the Plunder Queen that also wants you to sack five treasures or like Magda Brazen Outlaw. Uh, but however, this is in Rakdos and cares specifically about doing something that Rakdos loves, which is stealing other creatures. So there's, there's a few, but really kind of two reliable ways to make treasures in Rakdos. The first is in combat. 
So Grim Hireling says, whenever one more creatures you control deal combat to a player, create two treasure tokens. So very good. Obviously, with a first strike haste 3-2, a lot of people won't be able to block this. You also have the Reaver Cleaver, which we talked about earlier, and it's going to create that many treasure tokens. So on your commander, this could create you know four treasure tokens uh, if, if people don't want to block it. You also have Professional Face Breaker. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. And then the big bad Ancient Copper Dragon, which is a six mana artifact, or six mana dragon, Elder Dragon. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you roll a D20 and then you make that many treasure tokens. So you could potentially make 20. Usually you're a- around between like 8 and 15 is what it feels like to me. Well, maybe a little bit lower. 15 is a little high. But still, you're making a ton of treasures and then you'll have the five treasures to use for Kellogg's ability. The other way that Rakdos makes treasures is by sacrificing creatures, which is what you want to do when you steal a creature with Kellogg. So Pitiless Plunderer, whenever a creature you control dies, create a treasure token. Mahadi Emporium Master, at the beginning of your end step, create a treasure token for each creature that died this turn. And then Atsushi the Blazing Sky, when it dies, you can choose one, and one of them is to create three treasure tokens. And then, of course, you also have Revel and Riches, which I've never seen anyone win with. But whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, create a treasure. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control 10 or more treasures, you win the game. Whew. And then there are a couple other ways to do it. There's Reckless Endeavor, which is a sorcery for 7 mana. It's a lot. You roll 2d12 and choose one result. It deals damage equal to that result to each creature. And then you create a number of treasure tokens equal to the other result. So kind of a board wipe, but you might, for instance, roll a one or a two and then like a seven or eight on the other. So you could do two damage to everything and then create eight treasures. So that's sort of like another road you can go there. And then this deck, I think Zorn is an auto include. It's a three mana elemental that says if you would create one or more treasure tokens, you instead create those tokens plus an additional treasure token. Now, I did want to note that Insurrection, which is a card that steals every creature on the battlefield, costs eight mana. So... When you compare that to playing an Ancient Copper Dragon, either having haste somehow on the turn it comes down, or waiting a whole turn cycle, maybe hitting with it, and then rolling a d20, which you might hit one, means that you're going to be able to steal no creatures. If you hit 20 magnificently, you're going to be able to steal four creatures with Kellogg. So I think Insurrection is a card you want to compare to what you're trying to do in this deck, because it's like, oh, I'm doing this really fun, cute stuff. But it's actually like really, really slow and underrate compared to the massively powerful things that you can do with just an insurrection or another mass steel spell. So I would just sort of forewarn you that it's easy to get caught in the like, oh, I'm going to do this and then make two treasures here and then three there to add up to the five, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but there are other really efficient ways to steal creatures in Rakdos. So I would say the ability on Kellogg feels better if you're just holding up five treasures. Um, that you can use when it comes back to your turn. And so you don't have to necessarily be spending it every single turn, but you know that like as long as I have five on my turn, I'll be able to steal something impactful. Um, because you're going to want to have impactful turns. When you use all those treasures, you want to find other ways to make them powerful because you're sacrificing them. So Crime Novelist is a new card from Murders at Karlov Manor. Whenever you sack an artifact, put a 1-1 counter on Crime Novelist and add a red mana. So you're going to get double the mana off your treasures. Mayhem Devil is just going to ping anything whenever a player sacrifices a permanent and deals one damage to any target. So that's a great way to sack five treasures to Kellogg and also kill something. Nadir's Nightblade, whenever a token you control leaves the battlefield, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. And then similar to like Mirkwood Bats, but it's whenever you create or sacrifice a token, each opponent loses one life. Uh, and then Marionette Master might be a win con in this deck. Uh, you can fabricate three when this comes down, so it could become a 4-5. And then whenever an artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to Marionette Master's power. So I think that's sort of how you're going to win the deck that way, is by draining people or pinging them with Mayhem Devil or having a huge turn with Crime Novelist and then playing a bunch of stuff out. Of course, in this deck, you're making treasures. You're also going to want to put Academy Manufacturer in there. No prop. Now let's look at sort of the two versions of this deck you can build. The first one is the sort of get in with combat, control the combat step, hit hard and fast, and make sure your opponents can't do anything. So in this case, the Ancient Copper Dragon looks a lot better when you have a sneak attack in play or you are playing with a Dolmen Gate. So it doesn't matter who your commander attacks uh, because it's just one in attack to create a treasure token. You also have a great way to, to rough up the rest of the table by casting Disrupt Decorum or Carter Doom Scourge, which is going to basically goad everything you don't control. And that allows you, in this case, to basically 
be like, cool, now I'm just straight up making everyone attack. They're all going to be tapped out. From there, I can now have much more free attacks or bring in the big whammies with what I'm doing there. And then extra combat seem pretty good in this deck as well. Seize the day, relentless assault, especially if you're stealing something that's really powerful from your opponent. I will note, though, that when you take a creature with Kellogg, it does not give that creature haste, which is normally something that happens with steel effects in decks like this. So the other way to build this deck, and there can be an element of both of these decks in each of them, if that makes sense, is the sacrifice and stealing stuff. So cards like the Beast, Deathless Prince, it's going to gain control of a target creature until end of turn when you cast it to untap it, and it gains menace and haste. Furnace Reigns allows you to do the same thing, but it also allows the, uh, the creatures to give you a treasure token if they deal combat damage. Captivating Crew is really awesome because it's a repeatable steal effect as an activated ability on a creature. And then Mass Mutiny as well steals up to one creature that each opponent controls until end of turn. And then stuff like Mob Rule will allow you to steal either all creatures of power 4 or greater or creatures of power 3 or less. So those are the mass steal ways to grab a bunch of stuff. Notably, all of these ways do give the creatures haste when you get them so you can swing with them. So just note that about Kellogg. Kellogg's better if you want to steal it and then sacrifice it to something, but not if you want to steal it and attack with it that turn. Unless, you go, of course, you have like an anger in the graveyard. And then you have all your regular sacrifice outlets in red and black. You're going to play the altars, your viscera seers. Um, I also really like cards like Deadly Dispute and Nasty End in this deck. Uh, Deadly Dispute and Nasty End both allow, uh, make you sacrifice a creature as an additional cost. Deadly Dispute is going to draw you two cards and create a treasure token. Nasty End will draw you two cards, but if you sacrifice a legendary creature, which seems pretty likely given how Commander is shaping up these days, you get to draw three cards instead. And then you're going to get some extra value from the creatures dying. So I like stuff like Jury, Master of the Review. Whenever you sack a permanent, put a 1-1 counter on Jury. And then when Jury itself dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. So if you're stealing a lot of stuff or sacrificing a lot of stuff, Jury just gets bigger and bigger. Obviously, all the treasures you're creating are sacking stuff. And again, I think in this deck, you're not necessarily going to want to use the treasures to steal unless there's a really juicy target. Because you'd rather just use that to, you know, pump up your juries, trigger your mayhem devils, and then cast more impactful spells. Another one sort of in this category is Kinzu of the Bleak Coven, which I really like in this deck. Whenever another non-token creature you control dies, you may pay two life and exile it. If you do, create the token that's a copy of that creature, except it's 1-1 one, one, and has Toxic 1. So you can see your opponent's creature, you can sacrifice it, and then pay two life, and then you exile it, which is great because now they're never going to see it back. They can't even get it back from their graveyard. And you get to keep a copy of that creature, especially if it has a neat uh, enters the battlefield ability. So that is the Kellogg Dangerous Mind deck. Uh, definitely up my alley. This is a card I might consider putting into my Marchesa deck, but I love stealing stuff, and this lets you do it with treasures, which is a first. All right. Let's move on to McCready, Lamp Light Mayor. It's all about small boys and big kids too. So this is black and a white for a legendary creature human advisor. It's a 1-3. Whenever a creature you control with power 2 or less attacks, it gains Skulk until end of turn. So it can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. Haven't seen that in a while. And then whenever a creature with power 4 or greater attacks you, its controller loses 2 life and you gain 2 life. Okay. So, McCready stops your opponents from attacking you because you're going to gain two life and they're going to lose two. But more importantly, it allows all of your small creatures to get in a lot more easily. So, as a commander, I think this deck is filled with little creatures that are going to like to attack or deal combat damage. So, for instance, you've got Timna the Weaver or Virtus the Veiled, which are both small creatures that want to deal combat damage. Virtus notably makes a player lose half their life rounded up, which is so sweet. Um, you also have cards like Commissar Severina Rain, which wants you to attack. So whenever a Commissar attacks, each opponent loses X life or X is the number of other attacking creatures, which is really good because in this case, now Commissar can swing in. If it has Skulk, it's going to be harder to block. Oh yeah, there's another way you could build this too. Um, Alenda's Hierophant is really interesting um, because it is whenever you gain life, you put a 1-1 counter on it. And then whenever Alenda's Hierophant dies, you make X 1-1 white vampire creature tokens. So there is a world where you are building more into the lifelink side of this. This could be very playgroup dependent as, as well, that your opponents love to play mono green and swing with big creatures. Uh, so you're going to have a lot of life game. You're also probably going to play like your Mangara the Diplomats, Alenda the Dusk Roses in here. And then that way you can make a big army as well as have McCready give this amazing sort of skulk ability to everything. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, small boys that matter. 
small boys and girls. Uh, so we have uh, a bunch of creatures that are small, but just because they're small doesn't mean they're not powerful. So a new card, Delny Streetwise Lookout. Creatures you control power two or less can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater. It's kind of like Skulk, but it's not. It's not keyworded as Skulk, which is interesting. Uh, so if you did manage to make your creatures bigger, if you pump them after they attacked, then Delny by itself won't give them the Skulk ability, notably. But more importantly, if an ability of a creature you control with power two or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. So that includes McCready's second ability. That also includes abilities like Welcoming Vampire, which is pretty good in a deck like this that allows you to draw cards whenever other one or more creatures with power two or less enter the battlefield under your control. Um, and then you can also play board wipes like Dusk to Dawn. Dusk is two white white, destroy all creatures with power three or greater. And then Dawn is return all creature cards with power two or less from a graveyard to your hand. Had to tilt my head for that one. Assemble the Players is a brand new enchantment from MKM. Uh, one in the white enchantment, you may look at the top card of your library at any time. Once each turn, you may cast a creature card with power two or less from the top of your library. So I like that a bunch. Um, now, of course, now that you have a small army, the way that you sort of make this win is you're getting in for big damage. So there's an interesting toughness builds matter with like Balden Sentry Herdmaster. This is a 0-7. It says as long as it's your turn, each creature assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. And then whenever Balden attacks, up to 100 target creatures, you heard that right, each get plus O plus X until end of turn where X is the number of cards in your hand. So this allows your creatures to keep the small power for the Skulk ability, and it also would do tr double trigger with the Delny, and then swing for a ton. Uh, if you're building a token build, then you've got like Prava of the Steel Legion, which says as long as it's your turn, creature tokens you control get plus one, plus four. Most creature tokens are one ones. This would make them a two six. This with Balden is like, that's how you win the game. And of course, because they're small, they want to deal more damage. So True Conviction is a card you might play in this deck. Creatures you control have Double Strike and Lifelink. There's also sort of a version of this deck that just builds a big board up, gets in for a lot of small damage, and then on the turn that it matters, because you have such a wide board, you have your Felidar Retreat out, you've made a bunch of 2-2s, two and now you saved a couple of fetch lands, and now you can create a bunch of landfall triggers to put a 1-1 counter on each creature you control and give them all vigilance. So you don't care now that they're 4-4s four or whatever, but you can swing in with a huge army. Same thing goes with like Shadrach Silver Quill, which allows you to put a 1-1 counter on each player you control at the beginning of combat. It also is just a 2-5, which is great, because it also uh, will trigger McCready's top ability, um, so it makes it unblockable, pretty much. Pretty cool stuff. Um, McCready is, I think, a pretty narrow commander. I think he's better off probably in other decks, like your Commissar or Timna um, or Elenda. But by itself, I think the build is a little narrow. So if you do love to do this sort of thing, uh, build a small Creatures Matter deck, I think we're probably going to see more and more emphasis on that in the future, just sort of based on what we've seen card-wise recently with Delny and all that. So there is, I think, a lot more potential here to grow. So this could be a deck that gets more and more in the future, more and more tools. All right. Let's talk about one of the funniest names ever to put be put on a magic card. It's Mr. House, President and CEO. This is in the Hail Caesar deck. This is the backup commander. It is Mardu, red, white, and black for a 0-4. Legendary artifact creature human. Whenever you roll a 4 or higher, create a 3-3 colorless robot artifact creature token. If you rolled a 6 or higher, instead create that token and a treasure token. And then you can pay four tap, Mr. House, roll a six-sided die plus an additional six-sided die for each mana from treasures spent to activate this ability. So you're probably not going to be doing the second part of this ability too often because this is the, the dice rolling deck. Um, there's a ton of cards that allow you to roll dice. And not just that, you get to roll D20, which means you have a really good chance of rolling a six or higher to make a treasure token and a 3-3 three, three colorless robot artifact creature. So the first place you should look is obviously the Dungeons and Dragons set. The D20 cards are really good with that first ability here. So you got Vexing Puzzle Box. Whenever you roll one or more dice, you put a number of charge counters on Vexing Puzzle Box equal to the result. And you can just tap it for three. Uh, it's a three mana artifact. You tap it to add one mana of any card and just roll a D20. And then you can remove 100 charge counters from the puzzle box to search your library for an artifact, put it on the battlefield and shuffle. That 
Not as likely to happen. More importantly, this is just a way to roll a d20 every single turn. You have Delino Wild Mage. When it attacks, you roll a d20. 1 through 14, you make a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of a creature you control, except it's not legendary, and it gets exiled at the end of combat. And if you roll a 15 through 20, you get to do that again. You get to roll one more time and also still make that same token copy. Let's see here. Uh, the second place you should look for, for dice rolling is Unfinity. So this is like basically the Rachel Weeks commander, if you think about it. There's cards like Attractions. The Attractions roll a dice each turn. And there are a few cards that even roll a little bit more. So like Clown Car is an X-1-1. When it enters the battlefield, you roll X six-sided dice. So you could just pay five and roll six D6. For each odd result, you make a 1-1 Clown Robot Artifact Creature Token. And for each even result, you put a 1-1 Counter on Clown Car. And then you have Comet Stellar Pup, which is a four mana planeswalker, happens to be red and white, so it fits in this deck. And you pay zero uh, loyalty to roll a six side die. And there's a bunch of stuff that happens. I'm not going to read them all here because my voice won't take it. I'm not going to take it. No, we ain't going to take it. Okay, it's not the lyrics. Okay, now you have the ability to, of course, make treasures. So if you do want to find a way to fuel that second ability to roll a bunch of die and make a bunch of three threes, you've got a lot of stuff that can do it. And this is also going to really dominate the board in terms of making a bunch of six-sided die. Now, you do need to roll a four or higher to make a 3-3 colorless robot. So it's four, five, and six. That's a 50-50 chance. So if you do use treasures to activate this ability, you could roll up to, I think, uh, five D6 here. And on average, you're going to make two to three robots. So you got Jan Jansen Chaos Crafter, which has a haste Mardu creature that you can tap to sacrifice an artifact creature, artifact creature to create two treasure tokens, which is pretty good. And then if you sacrifice a non-creature artifact, you make two 1-1 one, one colorless constructs. So this sort of like powers itself out. Reckless Endeavor we talked about earlier. You're going to roll 2d12. You can deal a bunch of damage to everyone as well as create treasure equal to the other result. You don't want to go above four, though, because Mr. House is a four toughness creature. Pitiless Plunderer is going to make you a bunch. And then you got Treasure Chest, which is a artifact you pay for to sack it to roll a d20. And if you roll two through nine, you make five treasure tokens. Actually, this would actually be pretty good with Kellogg, now that I think about it. If you roll a 10 through 19, you gain three life and draw three cards. If you roll a 20, you basically detutor, but if an artifact, it goes on the battlefield. So, I like Mr. House a lot. Um, it's definitely a funny, funky card. Um, and there aren't that many dice rolling commanders or commanders that care about dice rolling. The fact that it's worded as well, that it won't sort of differentiate between D6 and a D20 is awesome. Because it means you're definitely going to be making treasures and definitely going to be making um, little artifact dudes. Little artifact dudes. Okay. Moving on to the last card before the mid-roll break and before I faint, of course. Mutational Advantage. This one's a pretty simple one. We're not going to spend too much time talking about it, but I will read the text because that's important, my friends. One to green and blue for an instant of a dude. I think he's like clocking a guy in the head or something. Permanents you control with counters on them gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Prevent all damage that will be dealt to those permanents this turn. Proliferate. So... This reminds us a lot of Heroic Intervention to give your permanents indestructible and hexproof. Now, notably, this also prevents all damage that will be dealt to those permanents this turn. Um, not that really matters with uh, indestructible. But this is a powerful card, but it's kind of like a one-sided fog because um, you can attack with all your creatures. If they block, then you get to do this, and then you know they're going to still deal that damage. Um, if you're playing a deck with a bunch of 1-1 one, one counters and other counters on it, this seems like a great card to have. Um, so only for certain decks, but it does do it all. So it proliferates, which is really important. It draws, I mean, in, in decks like this, you're also going to be playing Inspiring Call to draw cards and just have a ton of different ways now. In that deck, you have Inspiring Call, Heroic Invention, and Mutational Advantage to just give your creatures indestructible at instant speed. Pretty powerful stuff. Um, Inspiring Call, notably, is also, I believe, in the same deck that Mutational Advantage comes from. So it's a narrow card, but this is also great because Super Friends do count as a permanent with counters on them. So they allow allows them to be indestructible, indestructible, and I guess that's important about the preventing of the damage because they're not going to lose loyalty there. So if you're going to be playing Super Friends in green and blue, this is a slam a dunk. And with that, my friends, we are going to be taking a break and hearing from our mineral sponsors. But when we come back, we're going to be talking about perhaps the most powerful card in the entire set. 
It's a big one. It's also named after sort of uh, the, the name of the game itself. But first, let's take a quick break. Let me take a breath and let's hear from our mid-roll sponsors. All right, I will untap. I'll draw a card. Hey, have you guys seen Jimmy in like, I don't know, the past two weeks? Uh, I think he left with a big backpack and said he had important company business. Oh, bad news, guys. I went door to door in Burbank and sold almost no command zone merch. Why would you do that? We already sell stuff super easily on Shopify. Oh, yeah. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Whether you're working out of your friend's apartment or from a full office suite, Shopify is there to help you grow. I mean, you remember when we started the podcast, we weren't even thinking about merch. But when fans started asking for it, Shopify made it easy. They handled the selling so we could focus on the content. There's a reason Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. They've got great customer service, useful tools for your business, and the internet's best converting checkout system. So you never have any trouble turning browsers into buyers. Man, that's way better than what I was doing. Wait, did you actually sell anything? No. But I did see Timothy Chalamet at the gas station. He didn't see me. (laughs) Sneaky Timmy. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tcz, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash tcz now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash tcz. Man, these magic hunts really keep us on the go, huh? Definitely. We've had Philly, Minneapolis, Vegas, Chicago, even Barcelona, and of course, Amsterdam pretty soon. But you know what comes with us every time? Oh, yeah. Of course I know. It's the Cube of Consequence! Oh! No, no. That wasn't until Minneapolis. I was talking about our Raycon wireless earbuds. Oh, yeah. Of course. I take my Raycons everywhere. With their eight hours of playtime and 32-hour battery life, they're perfect for a long plane ride. Or to listen to music while exploring a new city. With their optimized gel tips, they fit so comfortably I almost forget I'm wearing them. And their noise isolation is perfect if you want to tune out the traffic and tourist chatter. Or use awareness mode if you want to take it all in and not get hit by a car. The best part is the audio quality is top tier, but they're just half the price of other premium brands. So if I misplace them on a trip, I don't have to worry too much about buying another pair. So when you're planning your next big trip or even just a busy day, don't forget the most important thing. Yes. The Q- hey, 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 Josh, we talked about this. Right, yes, the Raycons. Go to buyraycon.com slash command today to get 20% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. That's right, you'll get 20% off and free shipping at buyraycon.com slash command. Again, buyraycon.com slash command. I think it might need more card draw. Who are you talking to? Or is that just something you say? Oh no, I'm on a call with Jimmy. We're uh, building a Chatterfang deck. Ooh, I just added Toski. That should help, right? Whoa, the card just showed up. Yeah, with Architect, you can collaborate in real time from anywhere in the world. Changes show up immediately. You don't even have to reload the page. So it's perfect for brewing with a friend. This is cool, but isn't Jimmy just upstairs? Yeah, but I'm I'm downstairs right now. I ain't coming downstairs. Architect is the best place to browse, brew, and playtest commander decks. Just go to architect.com slash command zone to get started. That's A-R-C-H-I-D-E-K-T dot com slash command zone. All right, welcome back everyone from our mid-roll break. I'm still here all by myself. Remind me to never do this again. Uh, let's talk about one of the more sort of discussed cards in the game uh, from Fallout. It is Nuclear Fallout. This is X black black for a sorcery. Look at this art, by the way. Each creature gets twice minus X minus X until end of turn. Each player gets X rad counters. So rad counters is a new mechanic from uh, Fallout. When you get a rad counter, it reads like this. At the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, if you have any rad counters, mill that many cards. For each non-land card milled this way, you lose one life and a rad counter. So if you had two rad counters, you milled a land and a non-land, you would lose one life for the non-land, and then you'd lose one rad counter, so you'd only go down to one, and the next turn you would repeat the process until you basically get to zero rad counters. Um, so for it represents, if the game went on forever, the amount of damage from, you're always going to get that amount of damage from the rad counters eventually. Okay. So this is a good rate for a minus one, minus one board wipe. So Languish is a sorcery that is minus four, minus four until end turn for two black, black. And this is the same rate as that. Uh, However, with the added benefit that people get rad counters. So they're going to be milling cards, including yourself, by the way. I think five mana is going to get you minus six, minus six. This is going to wipe most boards, get around indestructible. And that's why we love Toxic Deluge. Uh, It's definitely a better cost of board wipe than Meat Hook Massacre. So Meat Hook Massacre is X black black for a similar minus X minus X until end of turn. And it has aristocratic effects on it. Um, So this does, however, still drain players' life totals in a way. Notably, however, this does mill other people. And sometimes decks will be very happy to get milled in uh, EDH. So that is something to be aware of. But the counters are really good if you're playing in a deck 
that likes to sort of go digging around other people's graveyards. Rise of the Dark Realms or Mimeoplasm decks. Love to see other people's stuff in there. Uh, a commander we'll talk about a little bit later is the Master Transcendent, which is going to give player red counters, but more importantly, again, likes to have cards in other players' decks. So I love myself a good X, minus X, minus X board wipe. Nuclear Fallout seems like it's going to see a lot of play, especially in a lot of different decks. So... This seems pretty good. Let me know in the comments what you think. Um, obviously, Black has no shortage of board wipes. So this is something that has a lot of potential. But do you think that the fact that it mills other players is too powerful? Let me know. Okay. Nuka Cola Vending Machine is our next card up here. A three-man artifact. It's a pretty interesting one. We won't spend too much time on it, though. One tap, create a food token. And then it says, whenever you sacrifice a food, create a tapped treasure token. So very cool, it changes your sacrificed foods into treasures. I, for one, will be automatically playing this in my Sam Loyal Attendant and Frodo deck because you're going to be making foods every single turn and making those into mana because you're always going to be sacking them to get Frodo's ability is pretty darn good. This is in the science deck, by the way. And this gets even better when you sacrifice food without needing to necessarily pay the two mana for their activation. So Sam Loyal Attendant is great because it makes the activated abilities of foods one less to activate, so it only costs one. But if you're in an artifact deck like Clark Clan Ironworks dot deck or Grinding Station, it doesn't actually care that you're actually sacrificing the food in a different way. It just says whenever you sacrifice a food. So Clark Clan Ironworks will allow you to sack artifacts to add two to your mana pool. Uh, Grinding Station allows you to sack artifacts to mill players. Um, and then there's also commanders like Bartolome del Presidio. It just says sacrifice an creature artifact to put a 1-1 one -one counter on him. Um, so that's pretty good there. You're going to make a bunch of treasures as well. And then Forensic Gadgeteer that we talked about earlier also reduces the activated abilities and artifacts down by 1. So I could see Nuka Cola Vending Machine sort of being like one of those under-the-radar cards that you don't see much of. But when a deck wants it, it is pretty sweet. Pretty darn good. Especially like the Sam Attendant decks and the Bartolome decks that just want to have artifacts to sacrifice. Of course, in this deck, you're also playing Academy Manufacturer. Why would you not? Okay, that was a quick one, thank goodness. Let's move on to one of my favorite cards in the set. It is the Pip-Boy 3000. Yay! So Pip-Boy 3000 is the thing that you wear in your gauntlet during the Fallout games. Uh, it is extremely useful. It's like the main character of the game in a lot of ways. Um, the Pit Boy, in this case, is a one mana artifact equipment. Awesome. With equip cost two. And it says whenever equipped creature attacks, choose one. The first is sort inventory. Draw a card, then discard a card. The second is pick a perk. Put a 1 1 counter on that creature. And then the third one is check map. Untap up to two target lands. So this is in the Scrappy Survivors deck. I. I think this is a generically just a very strong equipment because it does a lot of different things and a lot of different decks are going to want to have these abilities. Um, so if you're in the deck, the main thing is that you want to care about, you care about attacking. So if you care about attacking, then the Pip-Boy 3000 seems like it's going to be pretty good. You can put it on a lot of different creatures and just get a ton of value off it. So let's talk about them one at a time. So sort inventory. Every deck can benefit from looting, some more than others. So a card like Oscar Rubbish Reclaimer. Uh, three blue, black, three, three, costs one less to cast for each different mana value among cards in your graveyard. And then whenever you discard a non-land card, you may cast it from your graveyard. So pretty good with the Pip-Boy, because you're going to be drawing, discarding, and then casting those cards, as well as earlier on, it can fuel your graveyard to cast Oscar. Uh, as Morano Mardica Dice in the Coldicar cannot be cast unless you've discarded a card this turn. So that seems potentially useful there. I think this really shines in the Inti, the uh, Seneschal of the Sun deck. Whenever you attack, you may discard a card. When you do, put a 1-1 one -one counter on target attacking creature. It gains trample. And then whenever you discard one or more cards, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card until your next end step. So this both gives 1-1 one -one counters, which is something Inti's already doing. And it also allows you to get that double discard if you want to go that route as well. Um, and of course, the Braylon Shabraz deck. Braylon cares about discarding cards to deal damage. And it has Shabraz, which is a flying creature, which allows you to you know get in for that damage. For pick a perk to put a 1-1 one -one counter on that creature, you've got a lot of options here. Wyleth, Soul of Steel, a Slicer, Hired Muscle seems pretty sweet. Um, because when Slicer attacks on someone else's battlefield, you get the abilities that are on it. Um, 
You also have cards that care about the 1-1 counters like Marchesa, the Black Rose. Really awesome in that deck, as well as Shalai and Halar. Whenever one or more 1-1 counters are put on the creature you control, Shalai and Halar deals that much damage to target opponent. And then if you're playing a Hamza deck, uh, cost one less to cast for each creature with a 1-1 counter on it. But also creature spells, you cast cost one less to cast for each creature you control with a 1-1 counter on it. So a lot of usefulness here. It's, again, an equipment, so it's not going to be as great as just like a card that just is purely synergistic with your deck because you do have to attack. But I think the most important part on this is the fact that you can untap lands. So if you do equip this and attack the same turn, you kind of get your mana value back immediately because you're untapping two lands and it costs two to equip. So Fertile Ground uh, is a card that you can put onto a land that allows it to tap for more mana. There's a bunch of cards like this, Wild Growth and all that. Mirari's Wake allows all your lands to be tapped for even more mana. Uh, you have Lotus Fields, which are lands that uh, tap for a bunch of mana. And then you also have like the Sholatoyak deck. This is a deck that one of our office mates, Jordan, built recently that tries to stick as many different sort of like wild growth and stuff on their lands because when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you put a flood counter on the land and then that land is an island. And then uh, also at the beginning of your end step, you untap each permanent you control with a counter on it. So this deck has the ability to make a ton of mana. Um, and with a card like the Pit boy you get to untap those special lands and do even more on your turn and then untap them again because they have the flood counters. So overall, I like the Pit boy a lot. I think it's just one of those really fun, not super competitive, but powerful enough cards. I think that it will see play in a lot of different decks that just like one, two, or even all three of the abilities. At the very least, it's a looter. And that is a good enough card sometimes in some decks. And it only gets better in cards in decks that really enjoy the other parts of its effects. So, cheers to you, Pip Boy 3000. Moving onwards, we have Preston Garvey, Minute Man. Uh, it's been about 67 minutes since I started this podcast, which is making me feel the Minute Man, man. All right, Preston Garvey is two red, green, and a white for a 4 4 human soldier. At the beginning of combat on your turn, create a green aura enchantment token named Settlement attached to up to one target land you control. It has enchant land, and enchant land has tap add one mana of any color. And then whenever Preston attacks, untap each enchanted permanent you control. So a little similar to what we just talked about with Shola Toyak and the wild growth stuff, because that is what this deck is doing. It is making your lands very special and allows it to tap for any color, but most importantly allows it to untap uh, whenever he attacks, which is kind of like Sword of Feast and Famine. So you're going to want to put other enchantments on your lands that allow them to be even more powerful. Wild Growth, Fertile Ground, Abundant Growth, all that stuff is going to make these lands more powerful. And so when Preston attacks and untaps, you have all these enchanted lands that are outside of the ones that say Settlement on them. And then Bamo, Blamo, my favorite word, you're going to get a ton of mana to basically do a lot with that next turn. So you're going to have really explosive turns in this deck. Um, Buried in the Garden is a new enchantment aura that exiles a creature as well when it comes in. So it's not just making your land stat for more mana. It's also you can play on thin ice or whatever, and then that way you get extra value. You can also put like Squirrel Nest in this deck. And so your lands can always just keep pumping out 1-1s. A lot of fun stuff. If you're going to be playing the enchantment route and you care about having enchantments, there are a lot of creatures that like to enchant stuff because, again, Preston says untap each enchanted permanent you control. So that includes creatures as well. Elevir of the Wild Court and Gil Wayne, casting director, played very well and famously by Rachel Weeks on our Game Nights episode, are creatures that are going to create different roles, like the virtuous royal sorcerer or monster role. Uh, Elevir allows the enchanted creatures dealing common damage to draw you a card, and Gilwin just throws a ton of tokens, uh, enchantment aura tokens, onto creatures. So this is going to allow you to attack, untap those creatures. If you happen to be mana dorks as well, because you're in the colors, those creatures can then tap for more mana. If they have activated abilities, you can do it again. Uh, you can also play, very notably, Uril, the Mist Stalker in this deck, which seems um, very powerful. Uh, this is a 5-mana five 5-5 five, five Hexproof that gets plus 2, plus 2 for each aura attached to it. So with Gilwine and Elevier, you're just going to have a huge Euro that is going to untap as well. Um, and of course, if you're playing Enchantment, you have all the classics. So Sithis, Harvest Hand is very good. Uh, Enchantress's Presence. Uh, Winds of Wrath is going to be able to destroy all creatures that aren't enchanted. Sanctum Weaver taps for a bunch of mana. 
Uh, Jukai Naturalist, allow your enchantment spells to be cast for less mana. And then here's a really new fun one from uh, Fallout. It's called Strongback. So this is two and a green for enchantment or enchant creature. Equip abilities you activate that target enchant creature costs three less to activate. Aura spells you cast that target enchant creature costs three less to cast. And enchanted creature gets plus two, plus two for each aura and equipment attached to it. So this is just nuts in a deck that's playing enchantment auras. Um, it's going to make your enchantment auras cost almost nothing. It's going to make equipments cost basically zero unless they're above equip cost three, which is really awesome. This is just an overall very strong card. I would expect to see a lot of strong back in any deck that has enchantment auras or, um, or equipment. So yeah, that is Preston Garvey. Um, I'm sure you in the chat can find other broken ways to do cool things with tap untap abilities because again, having extra uh, times to activate your creatures is pretty powerful. But Preston's pretty cool by himself. The only downside is that he does himself need to attack to untap the enchanted permanents you control. At the beginning of combat, you automatically make the settlements. So at the very least, you don't need to worry about mana fixing so much, but I don't think that's really what you're, what you're worried about. You're really building around that second part because it's pretty darn powerful. All right, my voice is hurting, but I'm having a great time. I hope you are too. www.youtube.com slash at commandcast. I don't know why I just said that. It's just more words that I don't need to say. <laughs> All right, next up we got Sean, father of synths. Kraftwerk, uh, three a blue and a red for a three, four human scientist. And it says, whenever you attack, you may create a tapped and attacking token. That's a copy of target attacking legendary creature you control other than Sean, except it's not legendary and it's a synth artifact. Wow. Creature in addition to its other types. And then when Sean leaves the battlefield, exile all synth tokens you control. Uh, Sean is powerful. This is in the science deck. There are a lot of commanders out there that like to attack and have very powerful effects that you want to double. Notably, Sean says that whenever you attack. So if you have a Locust God, either as the commander or in the deck, you can just swing with your red and blue insects and the Locust God, of course, and then you can create a token copy of the Locust God. That's not legendary. So you get two Locust Gods, draw a single card and make two one ones. Woo, pretty powerful. Magnus the Red is also very powerful because when Magnus deals combat damage, it makes the 3-3 red spawn creature token. So this creature already wants to attack, but more importantly, you're doubling the effect of instant and sorcery spells. Cast one less to cast for each creature token you control. With Magnus out, you're going to have twice that effect, doubling the amount of mana reduction. That's kind of like a win the game effect on the spot usually because you can just cast some ridiculously powerful spell. Uh, notably also like Gandalf the Grey. Uh, has an ability that you have to choose one that hasn't been chosen. So if you have Gan two Gandalf the Greys on the battlefield, you can basically double up on all of those effects over and over again. The long and short of it is, is if you're playing Irenicus's Vile Duplication in a deck, you're probably going to want to see if Sean, Father of Sins, can fit in there. Again, if you're not attacking, then it's a little bit different, but it's pretty sweet. Um, Brutaclad is really good here because you're making synth artifact creature tokens that are copies. And then Brutaclad allows you to make a token you control become, e have each other token you control become a copy of a token that you control. So if you have Brutaclad out and you make a double of Brutaclad or whatever else, then you have every token become a copy of that. One, good luck with the math. But two, good luck opponents. Ha ha ha. Okay, so if you're playing this as a commander, you're going to want to have creatures that can attack and survive combat and are likely cheaper than Sean because I think Sean comes out at the top end and then that same turn you're swinging with the creatures that are on the board already. So like Torbrand Thane of Redfell is very powerful in this situation. Delino Wild Mage is really good because you can make even more Sean's. Yikes. Malcolm Keen-Eyed Navigator. Whenever one or more pirates you control deal combat damage to your opponents, you create a treasure token for each opponent dealt damage this way. So again, it's a great card that you can copy with Sean here. You're going to want to have all these cards being copied. Multiple Torbrands on the battlefield and combat. Hoo-wee! See you later, alligator. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to want to just make even more clones. Why not have two Sean's on the battlefield and get double the effect? Get out of town. Sakashima the Imposter, Sakashima of a Thousand Faces. Notably, if you do create spark double copies of another legendary creature you control, it's not making a legendary creature so that Sean won't be able to see it if it's attacking. But you can just spark double your commander instead. You know, I think this deck is really powerful when you add a couple of extra combats. It's kind of the deck that when you do this one time, every single player is going to stop, look at you and go, oh, you are not barely the problem. You are 100% the 
200%, 5 billion percent the problem, you got to die. So I think if you're going to try and go off with Sean, you're going to want to do so in one big turn. You want to cash Sean, find a way to get more mana with like a Jessica's Will or whatever, create some extra combats. And then from there, whatever it is, you know, do it. If it's a bunch of Tor Brands, if it's a bunch of Magnus the Reds and then the Burn Spell, um, there's a lot of different ways to go about it. But I feel like Sean is kind of a glass cannon in that way. But at the same time, if Sean doesn't work, you can just cast the Locust God and still be pretty good in your position and then cast Sean later or Irenicus is about duplication it. So it's cool because this is kind of like legendary red blue cards dot deck. In fact, I might even convert my Magnus the Red deck into a Sean Father of Synths deck because that way it allows me to just have a ton of value with all these different awesome cards like Locust God, Magnus the Red, and Gandalf the Grey all work really well together. So with Sean there being the Father of Synths and I guess Legendary Creatures in this case, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do. Okay, that's Sean. He's pretty sweet. Let's move on and let's talk about one of my favorite commanders from the set. It is the Master Transcendent. All right, this is one in Sultai, black, green, and blue for a 2-4 legendary artifact creature mutant. When the master enters the battlefield, target player gets two rad counters. So we talked about those earlier. They're going to make a player mill at their pre-combat main phase. You can tap, put target creature in a graveyard that was milled this turn onto the battlefield under your control. It's a green mutant with base power and toughness 3-3. Three, three. So this is a creature that you can tap when it creates once. So it has to be milled this turn. So when your opponent goes and they use their rad counters or whatever else and they mill some cards, if they mill a creature card, you can tap the master transcendent and put that creature onto the battlefield under your control. And it's a green mutant with base power toughness three, three. So in some cases, it'll make the creature bigger. Usually I think it'll keep it a little bit smaller because you want to hit some sweet, big creatures off of this. And you're basically stealing cards from other people's graveyards. And boy, oh boy, if you know me at all, you know I love to do that. So the first thing you can do, by the way, this is in the Mutant Menace deck. Um, it's the backup commander. The first thing you can do is just fill up your own graveyard and just graveyards in general and just do the mill thing and the reanimation thing. So if you play a Breach the Multiverse, every single person is going to mill. You're going to get a creature of Planeswalker from that, but you can also use the Master to take another creature at that same time, which is really exciting. Maddening Cacophony is going to make everyone mill eight cards. If you kick it, you're going to make everyone mill half their library. And in that case, you're definitely going to hit something sweet. Incarnation Technique is a way to mill five cards and then return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, but you can demonstrate it. So another opponent would do the same thing. Fractured Sanity is a way to mill a bunch of cards. Mesmeric Orb is really good in this case because it's going to mill on everyone's untap step so that you don't actually have to do it on your turn. You can wait for them to untap, and then they're going to mill from the Mesmeric Orb. Now, of course, uh, Sultai Ascendancy has been eroded, kind of. Uh, now it just says, at the beginning of your upkeep, Surveil 2, making it a much easier card to read. And then, of course, uh, Nuclear Fallout. You're already going to be putting rad counters on stuff. Nuclear Fallout is going to make sure everyone mills on each of their turns, and that way you can get multiple looks at different graveyards. Now... There are a bunch of value creatures that aren't necessarily powerful because of their power, which is great. Like Mimeoplasm is a 0-0. Zero, zero. So you can instead have it become a 3-3 three, three with Master Transcendent, which I do love. Um, cards like Shieldred, the Whispering One. It's a 6-6, six, six, but you don't care if it's a 3-3. Three, three. It's an insanely powerful creature. Same thing goes for like a Consecrated Sphinx or even a Crater Hoof Behemoth. If you're able to mill a Crater Hoof and then bring it back, who cares if it's a 3-3, three, three, right? So that's, those are an interesting way to look at other creatures to put in your deck that you want to bring onto the battlefield because it, uh, the Master Transcendent only cares about creatures that were milled this turn onto the battlefield. So it can be from your deck or other players' decks. Um, and, and, and a funny way, you can also make a Mold Drifter bigger if you return it. Uh, same with like a Guilt Feeder, uh, which is a 0-4, but as a 3-3, three, three, it's way better because it says whenever it attacks and isn't blocked, defending player loses one life for each card in their graveyard. And it's a 3-3 three, three now. <laughs> a Doom Weaver, which is a 1-8, Normally says when it's paired with another creature, each of those creatures has, when this creature dies, draw cards equal to its power. Now it's a 3-3, three, three, so you're going to draw even more cards. Um, I think the thing, though, that you really want to do in this deck, and the reason I like it so much, and it reminds me of like my Beamtown Bullies deck, is that you can use the Master multiple times if you can untap it. So let's say you have a turn out and you have, on your side of the battlefield, a way to untap it, like a Curious Follower, and then you Madden Cacophony and make everyone mill half their deck. Now you can use the Master Transcendent a couple of different times. Um, there's also cards that will double up um, 
your activated abilities when you activate it and you choose new targets. But I think the really sweet thing to do is give everyone rad counters or mesmeric orb and then pass the turn with a seedborn muse up, which untaps all permanents you control during each player's untap step. Or an intruder alarm, which whenever a creature enters the battlefield, untap all creatures. Intruder alarm, oh my goodness. Intruder alarm, master transcendent, man in cacophony. You're going to have a lot of fun. Because the creature's going to enter, it's going to untap the master, you're going to tap it to bring another creature back, untap the master, right? You can just go nuts with this combo right here. Um, Merc Fiend Liege is also similar to Seaborn Muse, and so is Sting the Glinting Dagger, which is an equipment that will untap the creature at the beginning of each combat. So, a lot of really exciting things you can do with Master Transcendent. I believe of all the commanders in the Fallout pre-cons, this is the one that I am most likely to build, because, again, I just love playing stuff out of my opponent's library. And the Master Transcendent being able to do that for me is just a cherry on top. Also a great deck for me to play Concordant Crossroads in because you can animate all those things out and then they get haste the same turn. Oh, so sweet, so beautiful, so awesome. Thank you, Master Transcendent. All right, that does it for Master Transcendent. Let's move on to the next card. It is Three Dog Galaxy News DJ. This is one red and white for a 1-5 human bard. Whenever you attack, you may pay two and sacrifice an aura attached to three dog. When you do, when you sacrifice an aura this way, for each other attacking creature you control, create a token that's a copy of that aura attached to that creature. What? So, whenever you pay, whenever you attack, doesn't need to be three dog, by the way. You can hang out and DJ in the background. Pay two, sack an aura attached to three dog, and all of your other attacking creatures get a copy of that aura attached to them. So, very cool. This is in the Scrappy Survivor's deck. First off, let's just talk about Aura Synergy. You're going to play SRAM in this deck to draw a bunch of cards. Core Spirit Dancer to draw a bunch of cards. Um, if you have an Arden Intrepid Archaeologist, you get to actually move your auras and equipment you control the target permanent or player at the beginning of combat. So you can put all these auras on other creatures, and then the next time you go to combat, you can move them back on the three dog, uh, which is kind of funny, or just any number of them. Archon of the Wild Rose, we're going to turn all of your creatures into 4-4 base toughness, power and toughness flyers, so now they're just completely unblockable. Yikes! Um, Eki Battle Squad, whenever one or more modified creatures you control attack, untap all modified creatures you control. After this combat phase, there is an additional combat phase. So, slight nombo that the, the first attack that when none of your creatures have enchantment auras, Eki Battle Squad won't work. But the second time you do it, it will. And, and it's a 6-mana card, so there's a good chance you play 3-dog, and you have a couple of combat steps before the Acubow Squad comes down, and then you're getting a lot of combats. Um, now, auras that have ETBs are going to be really powerful because you're creating a copy of them, and like let's say three or four of these auras come down. Hoo-wee! So, Sage's Reverie, really sweet. Uh, three in the white, enchant creature. When it enters the battlefield, draw a card for each aura you control that's attached to a creature. So if this is, again, like your third or fourth combat with DJ out, you're going to get a bunch of draws off of that. Chains of Custody, uh, two in the white. When it enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until Chains of Custody leaves the battlefield. Oh! Imagine a bunch of Chains of Custodies. Ho, 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 ho. Um, you also want cheap disposable auras that have good ETBs because, you know, this is a mana-intensive deck, right? Auras are already kind of scary to play because if someone removes your creature in response to it, it's going to be a feel bad. So uh, cheap disposable auras with great ETBs would be like Dragon's Mantle when it enters the battlefield, draw a card. So again, you're just going to be able to draw a bunch of cards with this if you're enchanting a bunch of attacking creatures. Atali's Favor is going to discover three when it enters the battlefield, which is pretty good too. And then, of course, now that you have auras and aura synergy, you're going to want a lot of creatures. Uh, fortunately, luckily, uh, enchantments and tokens, they kind of go hand in hand. So, a Johnny's Chosen is whenever an enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, you create a 2-2 white crack creature token. If that enchantment is an aura, you may attach it to the token. Whoa! So, the way this works with DJ is you attack, you have an enchantment come in after you sacrifice the aura, you make a 2-2, and then the aura can now go on that cat. So, let's say you're sending a bunch of 1-1s to their doom. The aura can now jump onto a cat that can attack with it next turn, and you know that 1-1 or whatever is going to die anyway. Um, Archon of Sun's Grace, whenever enchantment enters the battlefield under control, create a 2-2 white Pegasus creature token with flying. Valduck says at the beginning of combat for each aura and equipment attached to it, you create a 3-1 red elemental creature token with trample and haste. Whoo boy. And then you also got like mirror style master. Whenever this creature attacks for each attacking modified creature you control, create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of that creature. So... There's a lot of ways to go wide in this deck. You can stack triggers in a way that all the enchantment auras are going to go on your new creatures. 
and you're basically just gonna smack a ton of face. So I like this a lot. Seems like it has a lot of build around potential and I love decks like this as well because in the future, it's not like they're gonna stop printing enchantment auras. They're always gonna be in limited sets. In this case, we saw how powerful Tali's Favor is. It's a common from Ixalan, but it's a great fit into this deck. So you don't need to wait around for like rare mythic slots on commons to basically give you new playables. Dragon's Mantle notably is a common. So it's a great deck that can get slowly upgraded over time. It kind of reminds me of like Stang, the new Stang. Um, that is kind of similar in that, you know, it's just a cool deck that's going to have more and more toys to play with as you go along. Uh, in this case, DJ is uh, red and white instead of red and green. So you do have a little bit of stuff that you have to deal with in terms of color restrictions there, but still a lot of really fun stuff you can do in that deck. All right, we are nearing the end here, thank goodness. Let's talk about Vats very quickly. So this card got a lot of attention. It was one of the earlier cards spoiled for Fallout. This is two black black for an instant with split second. So once again, we have split second on an instant here. It says, choose any number of target creatures with equal toughness. Destroy the target, the chosen creatures. So this is a interesting semi board wipe. It is going to be powerful because it's got split second. So that your opponent can't like pump their creatures in response to make them bigger, but it's going to be limited in how many creatures it can hit on any given battlefield. Um, we're only going to talk about this for a little bit, but I think in a token heavy meta, this is very good. You got a bunch of one ones or two twos that are all going to get taken out. And also just because you have a one, one or a two, two, you don't actually have to get rid of your own creatures because you're choosing any number of target creatures with equal toughness. So this could just go around the table and delete a bunch of X ones as well, or delete a bunch of X twos, or maybe three is the toughness that matters. Um, and honestly, it's two black black for an instant that removes even just one creature, because technically you could use this as just an instant split second spell that gets rid of one thing because it just needs to choose one toughness. But for the most part, I think you're always going to have at least one other target. So minimum, I'd say this usually hits like two creatures. Maximum, it could be upwards of like 20, 30, if a bunch of tokens are on the battlefield. The question I want to ask you, chat, uh, or commenters, is how many creatures do you have to kill with Vats to be happy and to include it into your deck? For me, I think I'm actually happy if this gets rid of three things. I'm very happy if it gets rid of like four, five, or six, and even happier if those creatures that are getting removing, removing, removed are very impactful, powerful ones. So let me know in the comments below what you think is sort of like the ideal sweet spot for how many creatures you need to remove with Vats before it becomes an auto-include in your deck, and it, whether or not your meta even is supportive of a card like this. Okay, now we are on to what I believe is the last card of this set review. Oh my goodness. I'm so happy to be here. Drink a little more water, soothe the throat. <clears throat> Some people do like, you know, that's why they have casters that are in doubles. That's why they have two people doing things so that you can talk, wait, breathe, swallow, and then talk again. Going straight is tough, man. All right. Our last commander of the day is Yes Man, not Tough Man, Personal Securitron. Oh yeah. Two in the white for a 2-2 artifact creature robot. This one's a fun one. You can tap it and give target opponent gains control of Yes Man. When they do, you draw two cards and put a quest counter on Yes Man. Activate only during your turn. And then the second ability, when Yes Man leaves the battlefield, its owner creates a tapped 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token for each quest counter on it. So the owner is the person that casts the card, not the person that controls it. Um, this card is basically tap it, give it away, draw two cards, and you get a quest counter on it. And then you can wait until that's that person's turn. And then they're going to tap it and give Yes Man away. So the only text that's missing from this is that you have to say Yes Man every time you get this card. Um, now, when it comes to the second ability, it's not that great of a payoff. You're making a bunch of 1-1s. And not even that many 1-1s. One if Yes Man goes around three, four times, it's going to take three, four turn rotations. And, you know, it's not going to be that great. You're going to make three 1-1s. One um, so I think you're probably going to want to think about how you actually get Yes Man back to you instead. So cards like Homeward Path, 
tap, each player gains control of all creatures they own. It's good enough to run like an expedition map in this deck so that you can get Homeward Path back or like Sanctum of Eternity, which is two tap return target commander you own from the battlefield to your hand. Uh, not as good because you have to replay the commander. Homeward Path is sort of like the sweetest land in this deck. But you can also play cards like Sword of Hearth and Home because it specifically says exile up to one target creature you own. So you can get the Yes Man back because you don't really want to give your opponents the ability to draw a bunch of cards with Yes Man unless you're aiming for that group hug effect. So I think blinking cards that you own is definitely the thing to do here. Um, now, if you don't have the ability to get Yes Man back, then I think this deck actually wants to play the cards that White loves to play, which is like allow yourself to draw cards or do things when other opponents are doing them and taking advantage of that. So Smuggler's Share, two in the white. At the beginning of each end step, draw a card for each opponent who drew two or more cards this turn. Then create a treasure token for each opponent who had two or more lands in the battlefield or in the battlefield this turn. Your Yes Man's going to guaranteed give them the ability to draw two or more cards that turn. Uh, and then also Trouble in Pairs is a new one. Two white, white. Enchantment. I guess it's as new as Smuggler's Share, so not that new. If an opponent would begin an extra turn, that player skips that turn instead. But more importantly, whenever an opponent attacks you with two or more creatures, draws their second card each turn, or casts their second spell each turn, you draw a card. And then you also have Wedding Ring. Um, I'll read the whole text here. I know I don't want to. When Wedding Ring enters the battlefield, if it was cast, target opponent creates a token that's a copy of it. Whenever an opponent who controls an artifact named Wedding Ring draws a card during their turn, you draw a card. And whenever an opponent who controls an artifact named Wedding Ring gains life, you gain that much life. So again... This allows you to give Yes Man away and stay ahead of other players in terms of card advantage and not care so much that you're giving them cards to draw because you're drawing so many as well. And if you're going to be drawing a bunch of cards, then a card like Smothering Tithe is really good in this deck because you're going to get all the treasures to then cast those cards. Um, now, of course, if you are playing the game where you want to add a bunch of counters to Yes Man, then blink him and make a bunch of 1-1s, one you can definitely do so. Your commander is kind of a slow clock in that way. And I think for the most part, people aren't going to be super keen on removing it um, because it's a card out of their hands. And also, they may be the next person that gets Yes Man. So proliferation counter manipulation are things that white can do grateful apparition allows you to proliferate in white it's i think one of the only ways to do it and it's a little bit slow but it allows you to get those counters up the quest counters on uh yes man and then you also have cards like resourceful defense which is really interesting because you get to basically buy back the counters it says whenever permanent you control leaves the battlefield if it had counters on it put those counters on target permanent you control and you can pay four into white to move any number of counters from target permanent you control to another target permanent. So you can flicker Yes Man, uh, and then this way the counters aren't going to go away. They'll go on to another permanent, and then you can move the permanent counters back for the next time you flicker him. Or he dies. Uh, and then you also have the Ozolith, which is whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, if it has counters on it, put those counters on the Ozolith. And then at the beginning of combat on your turn, if the Ozolith had counters on it, you may move all counters from Ozolith on the target creature. So Resourceful Defense and Ozolith seem like absolute auto-includes in this deck. Um, and then if you're going to want to double up the, the tokens that you're making, you got a Mondrak, Anointed Procession. Those are just ways to just make more 1-1s. One -ones. But honestly, I don't know if that's how you want to win with a mono-white deck. There's plenty of other things that you can put in this deck to do with it. The real interesting part about Yes Man is the, the thing that's similar to the Karn to Betrayer, right? You want opponents to gain control of it. And then when they do, they can give it away to, gain, to draw cards as well. But you're going to want to find ways to get it back yourself with Sword of Hearth and Home, Homeward Path, and then other ways to just get a bunch of value from the card draw that you're getting from Yes Man. And with that, I also say yes, man, to the fact that I got through, I think it was like 19 cards or 18 cards from Fallout here. Um, let's talk about our favorite card from the set. My favorite card, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. It's the Pip-Boy 3000. It's a fun little equipment. I can see this actually seeing a lot of play over time. It seems really good in casual decks as well as in slightly more competitive decks. Um, it just has a ton of use, and I'm sure as Magic evolves, there's going to be more and more ways for the Pit boy to add to your entourage of abilities and things that synergizes with. In terms of most powerful card, I would probably put it up between um, Nuclear Fallout, just as being a generic board wipe that's going to see a lot of play, and maybe Sean Father of Synths, because it's just really powerful to double up, double up on legendary creatures. Um and there's a ton of, sy of synergy, synergy in those colors that make Sean really powerful as well. Uh, to the listeners, 
Let us know what your favorite card or most powerful card is. Uh, Fallout fans, um, all of you out there, I don't know how many there are out there, but I would like to know, does this set meet your expectations for the universes beyond? I know a lot of people that are Lord of the Rings fans were very satisfied with that. I think Doctor Who fans were really satisfied with that as well. Kudos to Gavin. Uh, but let us know if you're a Fallout fan, especially if a, a new one, if this set met your expectations, if you really liked what is coming out here. Um, and then, of course, what of these cards are going to slot perfectly into your existing Commander decks? I would love to know if you have some other synergies with, like, Sean or with the Master Transcendent that I missed. And then are there any commanders from here that you're excited to build? If so, let us know which ones in the comment below. comments below. Um... Of course, before we go here, you're going to want to pick up some of these cards. So why don't you check out our sponsors, cardkingdom.com slash command. That's the place to go if you want to pick up some of these new Fallout pre-cons or any of the other uh, new pre-cons or new universes beyond coming out this year, next year, forever and ever. Hooray. Cardkingdom.com slash command is the place to go. But more importantly, you're supporting our show while you do so. Uh, and you get the cards that you want in one convenient package sent to your doorstep, all of that good stuff. You'll love to see it. Cardkingdom.com slash command. When you get those cards, sleeve them up protect them with ultrapro.com slash command or have the fallout themed playmats deck boxes sleeves maybe you want those mothman sleeves i know i do they're pretty sweet looking uh or just do what we love to do which is like make all of the pre-cons sleeved up in their sleeves and built into their own pre-con environment so that when your friends come over they are not really that familiar with magic but they want to play something cool from lord of the rings or fallout or warhammer you can just bust it all out it's all themed and it looks really awesome ultrapro.com slash command is the place to do that it is going to have all of the things you need to make your battlefield look awesome uh, i for one love their binders i use them for all my collections because they have the sweet four by fours and if i'm collecting a play set of cards it looks really nice in there all right clean up step big thanks to our amazing team here at the command zone we got damon lens eric lem megan yep garav galati jordan bridgen jamie block arthur meadowcroft manson lung Jake, josh murphy jake boss sam waldo evan limberger katie cole mitch trafford josh lee Kwai, and rachel weeks Wowie, zowie, zowie, baboomy, kablamo, blamo, slamo. Yeah, I'm all done, mano. Yes, man. My throat is definitely saying, Jimmy, never do this again. And I agree. But my heart is saying, Jimmy, we're glad we could provide to the community. Let us know what you think about uh, one man podcasts and how we shouldn't do them ever again. <laughs> But it just so happens, you know, sometimes people are traveling, people are sick. It just lands this way. We have a Game Nights episode that everyone is upstairs furiously editing to get out in time. We had to take a break because of MagicCon in Chicago. So uh, glad to be here. Glad for all of you to have me here. Uh, happy to be here. So happy. Everything but my throat is happy. So that should tell you all you need to know. Don't talk this long if you don't have to, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. And I will see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>